Let me see. It should go. It should go. It's not going. Let me see. I'm going to stop and share again. Oh, I stopped the sharing because I thought that was going to solve it. I'm sorry. Como? Sí, yo supongo que sí. Let's see. There. So I asked also Lilia to speak for a little while on the Working Group on Women in Physics. She's the current chair. I am the uh, president-designate of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. I work at the University of Buenos Aires. I am also a CONICET researcher in Argentina. Anyway, so let me give you a brief overview of the uh, International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. It's a, the only global international scientific union dedicated to all areas of physics. It started a little bit over 100 years ago with 13 country members. And now we have about 60 territorial members. So it's not individual membership that we have, but it's through countries, basically. And we, now we have also corporate associate members. And since a month ago, we started a new membership category to try to incorporate uh, communities that are very small from uh, developing countries. The first country that we have as associate a territorial member is Nepal. We are now in negotiations with Nigeria, and we also expect to have something with the Philippines, I think. Anyway, so IUPAP is a network of networks, a network of communities, and it's organized and run by physicists. And the mission is all, okay, covered by the translation, but it's a very good mission. I don't remember it exactly, but we, we try to foster international collaboration and put physics towards solving the uh, more uh, important problems that humanity is facing right now. Anyway, so the main governing body is the uh, General Assembly, but in between the General Assemblies, we have the, uh, this structure that handles all, all the actions. The Executive Council, commissions that are organized by subdiscipline of physics, affiliated commissions, which are independent bodies that are affiliated with IUPAP, and temporary working groups. And the uh, executive committee and the chairs of the commissions that meet at least once per year. And so we had some hybrid meetings and in-person meetings. And next year, we are going to have the uh, General Assembly in person in China. Anyway, so this is just to give you a brief idea of how the commissions are organized, mainly by a subdiscipline of physics. This is affiliated commissions, and these are the working groups. And I'm sorry that something gets uh, covered by this translation thing. But anyway, there are a bunch of transversal issues that we try to address. Uh, like, for example, we have women in physics that is going to turn 25 years old next year. Then uh, we have physics for development is a commission, physics education. So transversal issues are, with, we handle them within, with the structure of commissions or also with the structure of this that should be temporary, but it's not that temporary. Now we have a new working group on climate change action, physics for climate change action and sustainability, and also a working group on ethics. Um, so they are, these transversal issues are very important for the renewed aims of the union that we want to promote physics as an essential tool for development and sustainability. We are also very deeply uh, interested in advancing uh, evidence-based physics education, particularly in developing countries, to increase diversity and inclusion in physics, uh, not only women, also people from underrepresented groups, well, then there are the usual aims, but the, the ones in blue are kind of the most, the newest. Open access to all data, early career physicists and physics students, physicists working outside academia, uh, uphold up openness and science integrity. So I, I've told you it's a network of network. 
And so what we try to do with our actions is to help build communities, to exchange useful information, to promote good practices, to nurture collaborations, and to engage communities to propagate our actions and views. So we, we cannot enforce, basically, just with the uh, activity. I'm sure that I, I'm sorry that I'm sort of, <laughs> because I'm looking at that, I'm sorry. Um, that we, we can enforce some, some, uh, some or put some regulations on the activities that we sponsor, and the activities that we sponsor are conferences, oops, international conferences, and we also give awards. And so we include some requirements that express these viewpoints on trying to increase inclusion and diversity, and, and also that there is no discrimination and the, uh, that knowledge is openly shared. And then we also have a travel grant program for women from developing countries that is open once per year, with the exception of the years in which we have the international conferences on women in physics that Lily is going to talk about. And we also have other travel grants that I'm going to talk about a little bit within a particular project that is sort of related to the Sesame project that you were talking about before. Um, so now, how can we contribute to increasing inclusion and diversity? So there are, we can recommend standards and best practices, and we have to be very respectful of cultural diversity. For example, a, in terms of gender and sexual diversity, there are huge differences across cultures. And so we have to be very respectful of that. That's, we have to balance, because sometimes we have our own biases coming from a particular culture and we have to accommodate many different points of view. And then um, we also impose conditions on the activities we sponsor and then we try to carry out some actions to help increase. And we engage in the global dialogue, in particular related to advancing with the uh, uh, sustainable development goals of the UN. So, as I told you, the main sponsored activities are international conferences, and a, we have different types of conferences. The largest ones that are for intended for over 700 participants, but they usually have a 2,000, it depends on the subfield. But we also have funding, a particular line of funding for what we call Type D conferences that are to be held in developing countries. And it could be conferences or workshops uh, or schools. And we allocate a special line of funding for that. And then we have the, the awards. Some of the commissions give awards to established scientists. Not all of them do that. And then we have the Early Career Scientist Award Program. That Those are given one award per year per commission. And in the last 10 years, we gave about 200 prizes. The prize comes with a monetary, monetary prize, a medal, and then the person who gets the award is portrayed on our newsletter and the uh, website. This is there. Okay, so there is the uh, website. <laughs> anyway, so um, other activities that, or actions that we take that we expect to have some impact is we issue statement and position papers to induce and or accompany changes and to support physics communities. We had a declaration on race. Uh, we have also the Waterloo Charter that I'm going to talk a little bit more about a, having a diverse pool of members in the physics community. We also uh, write letters addressed to governments upon the request of our own members when governments cut funding, basically. Uh, then we have also rules on our own structure on what we expect of the uh, chairs of our commissions in terms of gender balance, diversity of the countries, also on the executive committee, um, the, uh, among the what we call the presidential line, etc. Then we have some targeted projects. The two largest projects that we had recently, one was to reduce the gender gap in STEM together with another 11 international partners, 
And then we have a project to build communities of users of synchrotron facilities in targeted regions of the world. And so um, we have a newsletter and we would like to increase our visibility and we are trying to work on that. Um, sometimes these statements are issued by the Executive Council basically because they are urgent, but then they are approved by our General Assembly. And well, this is something of the, uh, okay. So uh, the, our members can submit recommendations and resolutions, and in particular, the uh, Working Group on Women in Physics submitted several resolutions that change the shape of our union. So inclusion and diversity, basically IUPAP, the, uh, I would say that the most successful, I think, set of actions to, to really help to have a huge impact was related to gender, started with women, actually. And so this started when the Working Group on Women in Physics was created in 1919, which was the uh, 1999, that was the 100th anniversary of the APS. So the assembly was held in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a, in parallel with the uh, 100th anniversary of APS. And it was created with that mandate to survey the present situation, that was the, the thing in the time, and report to the Council and the Liaison Committees and to suggest means to improve the situation for women in physics. It was supposed to be temporary and was renewed at every General Assembly. Now we are thinking of restructuring everything and keep this as a permanent uh, structure, different, not, not a working group. Uh, the first chair was Marcia Barbosa, she's here. This is a visit they paid to the uh, White House in the year 2000. Oh, here is Marcia, there is Marcia. And this is Judy France, she was the Secretary General of APS at the time. Um, so uh, Judy brought Jackie Bimon Keen, who was her secretary. I don't know if Jackie is there yes. behind her? Yes. I don't yes. see her. Oh, be behind Judy? Anyway. Okay, and so Ju and, uh, Jackie worked with us with the working group for many, many years. Now she's retired, but she's here, I think. Yeah, she's here. No, this is Shohine, I don't see. She's, this is Lee, oh, this is Jackie. Anyway, so the, uh, the working group had a huge impact because it created a network of working group on women in physics in many more countries than IUPAP members, particularly in Africa. After we had the, uh, our international conference in Africa, we had a lot of working groups that were created in, Af in African countries. And I started my relation with IUPAP. I didn't know IUPAP until I became uh, the leader of the Argentinian working group on women in physics. And I invited Karen to be part of that working group, and we went together to Paris. And there we met with Lilia and became very good friends since then, and we started all these activities eh, to try to replicate some of these things in Latin America. Anyway, so the recommendations and resolutions that the Working Group on Women in Physics submitted change the shape of IUPAP, and eh, then IUPAP also created the position of vice president at large and gender champion and to allow a better relation between the working group and the executive council and to monitor the, uh, that the uh, conditions that we impose for the organization of conferences and also for prizes, they are uh, followed basically. So I'm going to leave the floor to Lilia who is going to talk about the, um, I think that, She's going to give a little bit of acá. Ah. Sí, sí, sí. Se me enganchó todo. Tal vez este esto no. Sí. Uh, 
Okay, so thank you very much uh, to the organizers and thank you very much, Silvina, for allowing me to talk about a little bit about the uh, conferences, Women in Physics, which are very important for our community, as I, um, I want to convince you. Um, so th this is a, um, a short journey through our con conferences. I always work. So as, as Silvina mentioned before, during the 23rd General Assembly in 1999 in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia, the resolution number six on formation of the Working Group on Women in Physics was uh, approved, and it reads like this. It is resolved that an IUPAP Working Group on Women in Physics be formed. The mandate of the group shall be to survey the present situation and report to the council and the liaison, commi liaison committees suggest means to improve the situation for women in physics. So you see here that we have the mandate to organize a survey and we already have three, I think, three, one, two for physicists and one over uh, uh, worldwide and for many disciplines, uh, biology, chemistry and things like that during the gap, gender gap project. And uh, for, to improve the situation of, for, for women in physics, it was necessary to have a diag diag diagnosis, right? Because we didn't know. So as the, um, the one of the ways was with this survey, and then, but they also it was suggested to organize a conference uh, in order to have um, information directly from the uh, groups. So this is the... Um, a group photo of the first conference in Paris, and you will see Marcia over here, Karen, I don't remember where you, <laughs> and then Silvina somewhere, I am over here, like that, and as Silvina mentioned, we met Beth, but it was so, success, so successful, so uh, good, that it was decided to organize another one, and then another one, and, and we keep organizing this conference. Ah, you were there? Oh, yeah, you were great. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So the second one was here in Brazil, you see. The second one is in Rio de Janeiro. Then in South Africa, Waterloo, Canada, where the Waterloo Charter came from. And also in Birmingham, with Mal where Malala was with us uh, in our session. In Australia, um, there was the, the pandemic, so it has to be uh, virtual, you see here. And also in India, last uh, July, we have the uh, eighth conference, but it was also virtual. So, uh, and for the next one, we soon will open the call. So if any country is interested, it's the most welcome to submit the proposal. And I'm looking some people <laughs> <laughs> around. Okay, so. So I would like to talk a little bit about how the program has evolved. That happened almost oh, almost 25 years ago, and we can see how it has changed. Essentially, it looks the same. You have, we have plenary talks and panels, small group discussions, country posters, regional meetings, cultural and social activities. So this is the list of the uh, topics discussed in the first conference. You see how to attract, attract girls and into physics, launching a successful career, how to get women, women in position of leaderships at the local and the international level, improving the institu institutional structure, like what is now climate, right? Uh, and climate for the e women in physics. And also we wanted to learn more about regional differences because it turned out that there are in some uh, uh, developing countries are more women in percentage than in developed countries. So they wanted to know why could be uh, this could be possible. Um, well, I have some hypothesis about us, and then also this uh, pro, uh, about how to balance family and career. Essentially, these problems remain, many of them, but we have some progress, and it's thanks to all, to all the discussion and also all the programs that have 
have been implemented since this, uh, when these problems were uh, uh, addressed for the first time. It was um, also, we noticed that uh, women were lacking of some skills, professional skills. So since this, I think since the first conference, it was uh, pointed out that it was important to provide women with these pr uh, skills. So there were, through the different conferences, where workshops were implemented to provide this uh, uh, kind of skills, like uh, CV negotiation and things like that. Um, also because our community is usually at very small and we want to understand and, and address some of these problems of how to increase the number of women in physics. We, ne we needed to learn how to uh, study this uh, small data available in our uh, studies, well, I mean in our communities. More topics has been addressed. We have uh, tried, we have tried, we have try to com, um, contact uh, social scientists because uh, we have to understand this is a social problem in many uh, aspects. So we have to understand and we are physicists. Maybe we can, we can do models, right? Uh, numerical models, but we have to do. So we have more activities now. We have scientific posters and our activities and satellite workshops. <laughs> Very important are the conference proceedings. So this are, has been pu published in the a uh, American Institute for Conference Proceedings Series uh, with the uh, support of the USA team in the APS and the AAPT. The, it has three parts, the conference program, the country papers, and the science paper also. And then uh, seventh equip proceedings are coming soon. I really invite you to visit these uh, proceedings because you will find Mary a lot of interesting uh, information of the, uh, the different countries. And here is again the photo where we met. And you can see one of the advantages of having a virtual meeting because in the Australia meeting we have more Latin American participants. Also, the career development workshops were implemented in Latin America last July. We have the one in Honduras in the vir uh, virtual way, and now we have again in the hybrid, which I think is very good idea. Uh, the last one we closed yesterday uh, in this uh, room. Uh, there were so many other programs. I I cannot go through them because it would be too uh, too long. But there are also the the key weeks that uh, Professor Kim mentioned before. And I have to tell her that it also in Me Mexico, we have replicated them. So, and I hope that in some other countries in Latin America, they can be replicated. And also there are uh, regional meetings. Um, the gender gap was also very important. Two, were, two uh, books uh, uh, um, came from them, from it. And also uh, a multidisciplinary committee has been launch, which is also developing different actions, uh, in very important. So uh, just to summarize, I would like to mention that the worldwide impacts. So the first thing that, that I think this is very, very important, it made gender an issue to be discussed. Now in many institutes, in many departments, we are talking about gender in physics, which in the past it was a kind of even forbidden, I think topic to address because it's not physics, right? So it was something that was. So the equips and all these actions are, have been a very important ad umbrella for our uh, activities. Uh, we have now national, national teams and networks working. We have more participation and be better conditions for women in the, uh, not only in, in, in UPAP and its conferences, but also in the, at the national level, programs and materials, to attract the interest of girls to uh, physics have increased a lot and many other activities. And also very important, the adoption of the principles for gender inclusion and diversity, which we hope they came to our national societies in Cascade, right, that we can do it. Mm -hmm. So here is Silvina, the... <laughs> the um, <laughs> oh. yeah, now you can read a statement for the UPAP. 
So mm -hmm. we think that we really uh, are accomplished the mission of the IUPA with the EQIPS. Thank you very much. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about other aspects of IUPA. I never see here. Okay, so uh, now the, uh, the guidelines for our conferences include some minimum percent of women among committee members, plenary speakers, so all sorts of uh, invited speakers. The target could be 20%, but uh, the minimum, very minimum, is 10%. And then we also have an anti-harassment policy for conferences where a, the organizers have to appoint counselors that could counsel the uh, people for uh, those that feel the harassment and those that are accused of, be, of being the harassers. And also we have a, the condition that a conferences need to organize a session on diversity and inclusion where all the participants should attend during the conferences. Then the articles include the statement that the president, president designate, and the secretaries general, etc., um, shall be collected, and at least two of the offices shall be from a developing country, and at least two shall be women or men, but there are more I'm going to show you. And at least one of the president, president designate, and immediate president will be a woman, and at least one shall be a man. And then also for the commissions, we have some, some conditions. So these are some numbers of how many, how many women, women there is female, F, and M is male. Uh, in commission chairs, you cannot see anyway. And then we have the Waterloo Charter for Gender Inclusion, which is a, a declaration of principles endowed with a list of recommendations that you can look at to try to implement in your own country or institution. And we are now moving towards diversity, multidimensionality, to include other aspects, particularly uh, accessibility or people with disabilities, also people uh, ethnicity, and many, many different aspects that we are discussing how we are going to handle. And then we have also a condition on the diversity of candidates for IUPAP awards, Commission chairs have to guarantee the diversity of the pool. Then we cannot guarantee that the person who wins the prize is part of that diverse pool. Usually it's a man. But anyway, there, there, it's something. Uh, we changed the name of our, our Young Scientist Awards. I was, I was a little bit... <laughs> I saw that you were still talking about young because that's age discrimination. And that was a fight of women because they have different trajectories and they might reach some positions in their careers at a later chronological age. So we don't speak about age, chronological age anymore. And we talk about early career and we change the name of, of the awards. Uh, also, we have now a condition that the awards, have, I mean, candidates for awards are not self-nominated. It's other people who nominate them. So we request that they sign an, a statement that there are no concerns that IUPA should be aware of regarding the nominee, satisfying the expectation that it has a worth following the standards of professional ethics. And now we have the working group on ethics. This is the mandate, but we expect that they will come up with guidelines for our own internal processes. And because it's very, as I told you, being an international, it's very complicated. Now, the, uh, we started these discussions to try to address other aspects, and we redefined the uh, mandate of the Working Group on Women in Physics, and, but we are thinking of having other working groups on accessibility, on ethnicity, and a diversity committee, and something that is an umbrella structure having women in physics or gender, diversity, ethnicity, accessibility, but we are in the middle of the discussion actually. And physics education is another transversal issue that needs some, some renovation because so far the Commission on Physics Education is mostly researchers of physics education and works. They work as a 
another group of researchers, and it's hard to permeate to the local education communities. It's not like being the society of a country. We, language is quite a barrier there. We, we would need to have something like the work. I think that the success of the working group in women in physics was the creation of local working groups, so that networking structure that, that goes much faster to the countries. Anyway, and other relevant uh, actions for physics for the, is the Commission for Physics for Development that was created in 1981. We have the, uh, these Type D conferences, and also we have the Medal for Outstanding Contributions to the Enhancement of Physics in Developing Countries that very recently has been renamed after Kennedy Reed. And, and I don't want to forget, I mean, <laughs> I have something here about Kennedy, who received, a, was a fellow of the American Physical Society and received the John Wheatley Award from the American Physical Society for the promotion of physics research education in Africa. And so he was president of IUPAP from 2017 until his resignation in 2019, and he sadly passed away a few months ago. And he was a huge, I mean, a very strong promoter of diversity, particularly the inclusion of black people and um, promoting physics in Africa. Um, we have that type D that I told you about, the new associate territorial members, and we are part of this project. We, Lilia mentioned briefly the gender gap in science project that I mentioned too, but then we have these light sources for Africa, the Americas, Asia, Middle East, and Pacific, together with the International Union of Crystallography and the ICTP in Trieste. And the idea here, it started with a grant from the International Science Council, and the idea is to develop communities of users of synchrotron facilities. Today I'm going to Campinas to talk to the uh, director of Sirius, because we want to expand it in Latin America too. It's mostly in the Middle East right now, the targeted regions. And we need ad additional resources. I would like also to advance on the development of remote access of resources. AFRAMED, they have a network with a people being trained to access facilities abroad. Of course, people abroad, they say, well, we would need <laughs> additional staff to handle that. But maybe that could help. I mean, people in countries with scarce resources to be able to access very good instruments abroad without the need to go there. Anyway, um, so we are having regional physics societies being observers of IUPAP. We are analyzing how we could strengthen our relation with regions. And so we are also contributing or endorsing some collaborative projects in regions, in particular in Latin America. This last for free, Rogerio left, but he's pretty much involved with that, the Latin American Strategy for Fundamental Research Infrastructure. We also endorsed a similar strategy in Africa. And then another interdisciplinary project that IUPAP was key to be uh, approved is the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development that was started last year and it's ending this year. This is the inauguration, the opening ceremony with the current president of IUPAP, Michel Spiro. There were many, many activities. That was one thing that happened this year and we expect to have a flagship event in Honduras next year. And now the UNGA has proclaimed the International Decade of Sciences for Sustainable Development for the period 2024-2033. And so we expect that the decade will have an impact on the definition of new policies for the advancement towards the, uh, these SDGs of the UN. I hope that in Latin America and the Caribbean we can start more collaborative projects. I was looking at, the, uh, at this thing here of ICTP, and most of, the, uh, of the, the largest arrows go to the northern hemisphere here. It would be, and though then the other ones that are not so much highlighted are within South America. I would like all of them to be pretty strong and bold-faced. I hope that, that I could help do that. Anyway, so inclusion and diversity, all these issues need additional support.
and all our work is voluntary mostly. We don't have too much staff. And so we need additional funding and we need so that we can have more support. And let me show you who we are right now. This is the current president. This is the past president from Australia, the current president from uh, France. I am the president designate. One of the secretaries in Switzerland, the other one in Italy, with an a deputy secretary in Italy at the ICTP. Uh, Ruzzani, who is the associate secretary general of South Africa. And Boris Sharkrov, a uh, Russian. And then we have two support people, one communications part-time, and the other one, Gabriela, she is full-time secretary. And then we have all these vice presidents. One of them is Laura Green, who used to be president of APS. Niftia is from South Africa. Gillian was the former chair of the Working Group on Women in Physics from the UK. Monica is in Switzerland. Uh, and then some of the commission chairs are on the, um, on the executive committee too. Kui Juan Jin from C13 from China, Beijing. She will become a vice president for special projects, hopefully. Anyway, so with this, I finish the talk. I thank you all. So I had a question actually for both of you about regional differences. So I noticed when I came to Brazil 30 years ago that there were many more percentage of women than in the US, for example. Is there an explanation? I think it's similar in Argentina. Is well, there, if you look at Europe, for example, where they have very good statistics, it's inversely proportional to how much money is invested <laughs> in research. Uh, well, possible explanations that I heard, I remember the first <laughs> equip. One is that uh, academic jobs are not very well paid. And so it's uh, more common that women get uh, jobs that are not well paid. Then uh, also I think that it's uh, in some countries, uh, the, our physics is more closely related in the perception of, pe of people to philosophy than to technological applications. When it's closer to engineering, mm -hmm. like it is in the US, where most of the, at least, I don't know how it is now, but I remember once reading in physics today uh, that they were very worried because the, uh, most of the uh, people from the US, after their bachelor, w would go to the uh, private sector, and so mm -hmm. their graduate programs uh, were, could survive because of mainly Chinese and South Koreans and, and China was trying to get back their people so we, to China and stuff like that and they were worried. And so there where they are, it's closer to technology and to industry, I think it's more men. And, but also there is this like inverse relationship with the level of investment. And then at the equip someone said, oh, maybe because of the Madonna, <laughs> because there is a difference between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. And even, for example, countries like uh, Sweden, where you could think that there you have paternity leave, you have a lot of policies that are m more gender neutral, and, but that's super low, the percentage of women. But that's a, a possibility. Those are some possibilities. Oh, do you want to answer? I don't know, you have a comment also here? Then. Ah. Well, I have two hypotheses. First, first, the first one is in some of our countries, for example, in Latin America, the physics as a professional career is really young, just to mention. So the population is less less biased, like to um, some other countries like Europe, Europe or the USA or things like that. So this may be more one of the factors to. And the other one, I think, I'm not sure, but it may be also education, because we, when you look at, at, I don't know now, but in the past, when I look at uh, the uh, statistics in the European countries, not all of them have lower uh, in this um, percentage. But those who have higher are those from uh, with uh, Latin languages. So somehow, 
education is, uh, uh, for example, in Mexico in the past, we have to study all the subjects, physics, chemistry, and things like that. We were exposed to all these subjects. And now I see that they, uh, there have been changes that now, in, since they are very young, they have to choose a field. So they don't have to study physics anymore, for example. And that's a difference. And someone in the US told me that in the USA, the education is more, for example, interested in music than in science, for example. And that can be also a, a great difference. Yeah, yeah because uh, yeah, that's true. If you have the freedom to choose from high school or middle school what courses you are going to take, then maybe you start not to follow any science. And then let me tell you that when we started to talk among many of the women in physics from our generation, we had gone to sing only female schools. Because schools were segregated in Argentina when I went to high school. It was very common that high schools were either only for women or only for men. And I don't know if that is not also an effect. Because you don't have to perform. I mean, in a, as a, in a female type of role. You don't have to play a feminine role if you are with other women. So I, I really don't know. But I, I think that... When we started to chat, many of us had gone to only women's schools, but anyway. Oh, you see? You see? Yeah, I don't know. Right, I think the whole point is it's very complicated, right? The, the, yes. The, uh, uh, you cannot really solve this with just a few actions, and, and country to country, cultures is different. Even Asia, I yep. mean, if you look at Asian countries, Japan is the lowest. Among, probably the world lowest is, is Japan, right? And then China, Korea is a little bit better than Japan. But if you go to like India or Iran, there are the physics majors in Iran are more than 50%. So, so again, it's a very, <laughs> there are so many, the education is a part of it. Uh, the uh, culture is another one. And of course, in, in terms of uh, women in, in Asian country in, in general, they even though there are many uh, those who, who have a fixed majors, later higher education, you have a lot of family responsibilities. There are social responsibilities that really block them go further. So that's another cultural issue. So I'm just complicated. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, at the first international conference, there was this woman from India, and she said, well, in India we have many physics students, but then after postdoc, or we drop quite a bit. But, and maybe we are more than in other countries because we don't have to look for our boyfriend, for our future husbands, she was saying, because our family is taking care of that. So you can study. And then when you get married, it depends on your husband. If it, the, the, the husband will allow you to, to do science or not. And then let me tell you something else. I remember once at one, at, in Canada, I think, a woman from Uganda, she stood up and said, I could come to this conference because it's a women only, oh, well, women in physics. It was not women only because we encourage men to go to, to those conferences. But she said, my husband wouldn't allow me to go to other activities. So that was very incredible to me uh, about regional differences, let me tell you. Uh, I, I, just, just a small clarification uh, about education in Argentina. I think, I mean, it's... It, it's uh, the private or religious schools had the separation between women no. and men, but not public schools. No, no. I went, all my schooling was public, and normal schools, which you used to become a yeah. teacher when you finish okay. your school, yeah. you, it was all segregated. We, we wear the uh, white guardapolvo. But it wasn't forbidden for men. Pardon me? It wasn't forbidden for no, men. No, it was forbidden. It was only women. Todas las escuelas normales, okay, okay, okay. Well, todas well, las escuelas normales, well. en, yo soy muy vieja, en mi época <laughs> eran solo de mujeres por un lado yeah. y de varones por el otro. Los yeah, that, that, luckily that changed. Uh, that well, changed. Yeah. That, it's not that, that way that now. Yeah, in my, my time it was that way. Yeah, okay. Uh, my, my point was to congratulate you for, for all what has been done in the IUPAP too, because I mean... Since, since the very beginning, uh, we were with, with Silvina working in these things, and then it, it all continued, and, and uh, she took the lead on that, and also with Lilia, and 
really a congratulations for all what was achieved because as Lilia said, this now it's, uh, it's uh, really being discussed in institutions in, and, uh, and this is in, in great part due to what IUPAP did. And uh, I think all this experience can also be, uh, 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 can also help also now to, um, to uh, foster or to be applied to uh, the, the subject of, eth of, of inclusion and diversity. So uh, like, like the APS, I mean, uh, the APS has a women in, in uh, physics uh, uh, special group or, uh, but uh, so it would also be interesting to include the topic of diversity, diversity and inclusion, uh, which also s adds up to all oh, the efforts. Oh, we are doing in, that. Um, I, I mentioned that. We are doing that. Yes, yes, yes. That's why I'm, ha I'm happy to see that and all this experience. I mean, uh, maybe we can discuss uh, this afternoon if we, if we look at uh, uh, specific things, but uh, uh, maybe re working groups with it like the APS did and, and maybe a couple of others, but it's just beginning. So I think it's a good moment to have this discussion and uh, so it adds up to, to the general inclusion and, uh, and diversity. Yeah, I was also asked about neurodiversity at, at another, at CLAF, there, there was about neurodiversity and I've noticed that for example, the Biophysical Society in the US, when you, if I am a member of the Biophysical Society, and you have to fill out if you are in a neurodiverse group. And so there are many, many issues now, and we don't know much. In front. No? Okay. I have one question. Uh, so you have been organizing this conference for gender gap issues for 25 years, is it correct? Okay, so I would like to ask if uh, during this time you have seen any positive um, difference and what would be the most important outcome of those 25 years, if you had to summarize? Um, first of all, as Lilia mentioned, having this issue brought up because at the beginning it was not accepted by the physics communities. I remember when I, we started uh, being part of this, but the, uh, organi with the organization, we didn't start 25 years ago, but we were part of it. And the, uh, when I came back from the first international conference and gave a talk, I remember at Conea, and a woman there, she said, oh, there are more urgent uh, things to, to look at in our countries. This is a subject of the developed world. It's not something that affects us. But actually, it's a subject that does affect us in developing countries, plus it's intersected with many other issues like ethnicity and any other things that you can think of. But it's, it is, now it's recognized at the time. It was not. It was not completely. And many people were saying, I never felt discriminated and stuff like that. And then you show the numbers. And, and I think that now, now it's completely different. Then uh, we ask the uh, country members, uh, I mean, the, these country teams, because this is a network of networks. So the, uh, this is for the IUPAP. Uh, we ask that they tell us which how they improve, because we cannot monitor improvement locally. That's the, the problem with an international union. It's not that we can uh, go and, and exert action directly in the institutions at the national level. We can, I don't know, convince some people from those countries and they have to do something eh, and try to get eh, policymakers implement changes. And so, I think that there are, I don't know exactly in other countries. I know more in my country. And well, in Argentina, it changed completely after the uh, uh, New Amenos movement that I, I guess you've heard of. It. That was 2015. Uh, it was mostly related to gender violence. And the first uh, actions, very concrete actions that had, a, I mean, we, we, we are taken and had a lot of impact at, in higher education institutions was related to gender violence. Like the University of Buenos Aires passed this protocol in 2015. And if you look at all the uh, universities, they started with their protocols on how to handle uh, issues of gender violence. 
and then also micro machism, so whatever, but basically gender violence with, with the problem that the people can be killed, you know? And yes, and so, and that, that was a turning point. And now we have a law, mandatory law in Argentina that all public servants have to undergo a training in gender diversity. We also advanced to, uh, towards the, um, what we call the uh, gender identity so that anybody can choose its own identity, have its national document change with its own identity. We have a national law of quotas for transgender people in public institutions. Uh, so it changed a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, not only in science, throughout society. Very different. But I don't know the details of the other countries. Okay, so as I, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, um, this is a very important umbrella for us. Because I have heard uh, when uh, I have heard from some other colleagues, but in their institutions or even in their societies, they refuse to talk about this because it's not physics. Because we are everywhere, everywhere, everyone is fine. We have, we are very fair people. We don't discriminate. We are open-minded. Blah blah blah. So then, um, but they have pushed hard. And, and were able to organize, even in some countries, for the first time, uh, some events like this, when we talk and discuss about this. I was checking the executive board of one society because I was looking for something, for example, in one Latin American country, and I was so shocked when I saw, when the, for many years, in the executive board were only men. You see, for the first time, this time, they have uh, some women, more than one. And I think that it's also very important because it has given voice to several groups which in the past didn't express all the, um, uh, that they were, they were not feeling well in this, uh, when developing this career. So uh, that, I think I summarize this with this. Okay, so let's thank the two speakers again.